I have a question for Catalina. I realize, of course, that there's a lot we don't know about Vautier's, but looking at her pictures, I see so much of France. I see a great deal of Poussin uh, in the Bacchus and a lot of Philippe de Champagne. And I'm wondering if you have any comments on just the visual impressions. It's too. Her style is very difficult to, to determine in a way because it's, it's a mix of Flemish, French and Italian uh, influences. It's very strange. And of course, she lived in Brussels. She was born in Mons, but she had also family living, for example, in Valenciennes. And the question is, of course, whether she was really yeah, uh, familiar with uh, French art or not. So. I suggested that her brother, Charles, uh, could have traveled to Italy. Uh, maybe it's evident to think about uh, uh, Italy, but it may also have been uh, the case that Charles Wautier, for example, lived in Paris for a while. Yeah, and it was a very wealthy family, and they were very well connected. For example, one of the brothers lived also in Madrid. So it's hard to say, but you're completely right that there is also a lot of French uh, Influence. Also, when you look at the colors, for example, it's 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 yeah very well comparable to what uh, Poussin did, and also Philippe de Champagne. Yeah. One one thing that comes to my mind is is Van Loon and even Coburger a little bit. That's yeah, yeah. And Philippe de Champagne is is, is a Fleming. Um, yeah, so yeah. It, it was born in Brussels. Yeah, one yeah. thing that's happened with the feel of Flemish painting in general, it seems to me, is that Rubens and Van Dyck and the Bruegels overwhelm everything, and the Van Loon. These are the major painters at court and. Yeah. They're big, big stories at the time, and she seems close yeah. to that somehow. Yeah. Stylistic connections with uh, Theodore van Loon, for example, uh, have been, uh, um, can I say, some colleagues have also, have al already stressed on the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the comparisons to make between Theodore van Loon and uh, um, uh, Michalina. And I think it has to do with Wenzel Kuber, because I introduced also Anna Francisca de Bruins. Why? Because she was a niece of Francar, but she was also a niece of Wenzel Kuber. And Wenzel Kuber, of course, was the architect of the church of uh, Scherpenheuvel, for which Theodor van Loon painted his most important cycle of paintings. So it's, it's very hard to, to uh, let's say, to retrace or to, to reconstruct her biography, as it is for the biography of his, his uh, brother. So it's my intention. I was given a sabbatical for the first time in my life <laughs> until January now, and it's, it will try, I will try to do more research in the Brussels archives because, yeah, because we know so little. It, it is extremely frustrating. And yeah, also from a scholarly point of view, uh, disappointing that you only can come up with some presumptions and suggestions. So uh, I hope to to find to find out more, and especially I hope to find something about, uh, concerning the place where, for example, her brother uh, received the training. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating, and I'm I'm just wondering. This is a question about interpretation. I'm. With the Bacchus picture, I find, I mean, the idea of the male nudes as a certificate of professional proficiency and also the figure of the female painter standing kind of above this cortege of lust and with a slightly critical or distanced view. But I also wonder whether there's something going on, it, whether the painting is making certain kind of sardonic insinuations about female desire and its, and it, the, its, its existence or possibility, particularly given the, the placement of the genitals of the Bacchus figure. Yeah. I would wish that I could answer your question because it's, it's, it's very complicated. But of course there is this, she's not looking at the, 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 the Bacchus scene, let's say, but she's connected, of course. So maybe, I don't know, she stayed unmarried and it was a rather pious and devout family of which she came, but it does not uh, exclude, let's say, your uh, presumption. Maybe on the contrary. The one in close red remind us of either Diana or the Amazon. Yeah. 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 And also, it's it's a very 
strange small breast, no? <laughs> it's a bit, it's surprising because it, it desexualizes her in a way, especially when you think about the way, for example, contemporaries such as Rubens had painted uh, breast before 1640. It's, it's, it's very, uh, yeah. Initially, I thought that it might have been connected to the fact that she was also kind of an Amazon, but there is no attribute that, yeah, in a way, um, yeah, adds to the presumption that she might be an Amazon. But if you see a bucket, you could have a Diane. Um, yeah, but not in the traditional iconography. Yeah, it's the same for Ariadne. Yeah, some of my colleagues. Yeah, he said maybe she is to be identified as Ariadne, but this does not make sense either. I. Well, I, I was just wondering, the uh, portraits of the um, officers reminded me so much of Sverts. <laughs> and I was wondering, Laura, what your impression of that was, with the yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of crony that turned tail and the yeah. pompadour and the, the posture. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so um, I think, and we've, Katana and I have talked about this, they were, Michael Swartz's portraits and tronies are very similar to what Michelina is doing. And so I think this is part of this Brussels world um, in the early 1650s, and they must have, have known each other, and Swartz had an academy, so the question of could she have actually drawn the nude from life in Swartz's academy in Brussels in the early 1650s, and I think it's possible. Just one interrupt, because this was exactly the point I was going to raise. The source of those early portraits of generals is Titian. It's a series of emperor busts that uh, for, for the Duke of Mantua, they're now lost, but in the 1630s, it already been reproduced the entire series by Sedler in Prince. And, 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 and Rubens also. So, I mean, and they're, it was virtually a citation. So, uh, I think that we have to, keep, have to keep in mind the Italian sources through Prince and through the What one interesting thing to me in the context of, of women, the idea that um, it seems to me that for a you know, high-end court figure like the Archduke Leopold William, bringing someone like her under his wing is a way of showing his power too. You protect the marginal or the odd cases and, and then they're, they're free to operate if they're under your protection, and that is a way of displaying power also in a way. And, and um, I would say I don't necessarily see him being surprised what, by what she came up with in the end because of this idea that it still happens today. You can see it in many aspects in society. You know, because of my power at the time, the power coming from the court, I can protect that which is marginal, and it can exist if it's close to me, and that shows what I am. Thank you. I did not see it in, in that way, but you think he would not have been surprised? I don't. I don't see. I don't have any reason to think either way, really. I don't. I don't know why he would have been uh, in the context of what kinds of paintings were visible at the time, but I, I don't. I don't see why, especially so. Do, do we know anything? I mean, after that painting, is there a continued relationship with with Leopold? So it ends with that painting. A completely different profile. Yeah, we don't know anything about Clara Peters, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> And, but we don't have any reason to think she's close to court or protected because if she would have been, it would, someone would have mentioned it. And I think uh, the, 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 the figure that you ex told us about, which is fabulous, I can see we should go out and buy some of her works. They're going to go up immediately in price. Uh, but I think she's a classic case, and as far as we know, of protection by noble family or by closeness to someone in power, and that allows her to be what she is. The strange thing is also that uh, she has never been mentioned between 1659 and 1770. So this is remarkable because when you look, for example, at, at 
other uh, anthologies of, of uh, artists such as Cornelis de B or also uh, um, Weyermann, I, I don't know. They all, for example, refer to flower painters as, as Clara Peters and, and as a daughter of Justus van Egmond. And there are many of them, but there is no reference to uh, Michalina as if she was so exceptional that it was not possible to, to integrate her in this kind of, of overview. I don't know, but I think, in my view, it's, it's remarkable. Hmm? Yeah. Um, just to mention, uh, I would follow up on what Alejandro said regarding Leopold Wilhelm's reception of that painting. I also wouldn't say that he was surprised, because the way uh, you presented the painting and its relationship to Heimskerk there seems to be a very intentional paraphrase going on here and reinterpretation. And the Hemskirk painting, which is essentially the procession of Bacchus returning from India, the meaning of that, obviously, is transfer of cultural codes and civilizations. So what we are talking about is following of Bacchus, the creative impulse, bringing of culture, and then Wilhelmina puts herself as one of the followers. Mm -hmm paraphrasing Hemskirk, yet she distances herself, so she's doing a free-form interpretation of Hemskirk in her own way, refiguring in a certain way. So I think that there is a very sophisticated play going on, rather than surprise on part of the patron. So that, that's what I saw there in the relationship. But I also wanted to ask Alejandro, or, or Regarding your uh, mentioning of the Sine Serere and Bacco Frigate Venus, that last painting that you brought into the discussion, I think it works very, very well with the nymphs and satyrs. And would you really uh, think that, in a way, Rubens is providing us with a new understanding of that expression? Because that was painted by so many people around 1600, right? Holtzius made it so famous, but that Rubens is actually articulating it in a very novel way through the nymphs and satyrs, which is what you suggested towards the end. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. I think it's, it's, it's good to tie it into that tradition. Indeed, it's, a, it's an image that has been used. I think what's great about Rubens is how naturally he seems to, the, the, these things are about the flow of these feelings in life and it seems very natural to him. I should add that, that we don't, we're not sure what that picture looked like originally. The research being done now in Antwerp has later editions and I'm not sure where that has ended, how, many, how much of that picture is original and how much it's not. It's a very didactic painting about his intentions and I think it's interesting when, when uh, looking at Rubens as a painter of mythologies to see that the mythological tradition is such is, is one that allows for, um, for drivers to innovate and to be creative. If you read from Hesiod and Homer onwards, it's not one of you know, an accepted truth that is repeated, but rather of reinterpreting what people have said. And I think Rubens sees himself very much in that light, and he's keeping it alive by retelling stories with, with his own points to make, in a way. I mean, but it's, it's one of his most didactic paintings to my eye. It's not as beautiful as the painting downstairs, which really is one of Rubens' most, most beautiful paintings to me now. But it's a very, that, that picture really explains what, what these things mean to him. And it's a very you know, beautif beautifully poetic idea. So both of your papers in very interesting ways talked about sort of rare rare examples, the female artist painting the nude in the 17th century. But what we have not talked about at all is love. And in this whole discussion of the nude, and we think so much of sex and lust and what you should look at and what you shouldn't look at, but you're, it's the first time that we've actually talked about love. And I wonder if you could speak a bit more about that, because we'll <laughs> talk more about love. Um, you know, is this something that, who knows what Philip thought when he looked at these paintings, but is this something so specific to the way he would, maybe Rubens painted them, the way he would have seen them? Would other contemporaries have really experienced or responded to this idea of love? Yeah, well, I think um, several answers to that. One, Philip IV is, 
born in 1605, so he's he's a kid, he's a youngster, you know, he's into these things naturally, especially at the time. Um, at the same time, he, you know, he, he's versed in ancient poetry and in and ancient culture the way all these people are at the time, and I think um, to him it's only natural to see these things through these codes, it seems to me. Um, Philip the Fourth writes letters. I think Hilliard, you mentioned one of them, or one of you did. Maybe it was you. I think I'm not sure. Uh, writes letters later in life, in the late forties. He kind of turns and he says, "The defeats of the Spanish army are explained by the lack of morals in my early life." And he says, "In order to to have God favor us, we need to change our behavior, country and me personally." He writes this, and he really goes in this correspondence with this nun, with Sor Maria de Agreda, and it's a, it becomes a very specific, almost remorseful, once again, I mean, St. Ignatius is another one of these stories. It's a great thing, you can be really bad as a youngster, and then you can, you know, through remorse, be saved. And, and Philip IV clearly goes, goes through this, through this um, transformation, and he looks at these things from the future as part of a immoral path in his life. Yet these things remain hanging in the palaces and so on. And it's not until the 18th century that King Charles III suggests that they all be burned. Uh, and with, and you know, there's a, the, one of the court painters at the time says, let's not burn them, let's keep them for artists to study. But I think the, the you know, I, I personally, I think one of the things that one learns from Rubens is a very frank, very well-balanced, and very complete idea of love, which is one that is, that is informed by pre-Christian ideas coming from classical antiquity without Christian guilt and without Freudian uh, um, you know, scientific understanding, but rather you know, on, the, on, the, on the reins of myth-telling. I, I find it to be a real contribution to life and, and to, to understand these things through Rubens and through him to end up in reading ancient sources. I think it's important. I think we can only convey that in, in writing, or you know, in the quality of writing or speaking, which is the, the, how these things overlap. And the result of overlapping is the complexity of life. And if we kind of dissect it in different sections, we're just not being able to uh, convey things in, in all their complexity. We may have time for one more question. about their paintings and what they meant. Did he have, did Rubens have writings? Rubens does have writings. He has letters. But basically, there are descriptions meant to convey to a, to a prospective client what he has. Uh, so we don't have um, a lot of poetic descriptions. But we do have, in the case of Rubens, descriptions of how they learn as children. And they learn in, in ways that were not so not so strange really in Europe until two generations ago, which is by being able to understand oneself through co quoting ancient authors. And you, you understand the idea of loss, for example, by quoting Horace or whoever it is, and you understand the idea of love or happiness or joy by quoting ancient authors. And you learn to do this by memory to a point where you're able to do this all your life. And I certainly was not part of that anymore, barely, but I was in, in Europe, but it had been that way for a very long time, and we have good friends of Rubens are being taught by Eustace Lipsius especially, and, and this is the way they, they learn about life, is by quoting the great, the great authors of antiquity who have explained what each one of these feelings is. Uh, and and um, it's a really, it's a wonderful way of, of understanding the, the self, it's the you know, pre-Freudian, of course, and pre-personal psychology, but I think that would be the answer. You, you do have, um, Rubens, for example, when he loses his first wife, instead of saying, 
you know, I'm so sad or I'm so sorry, he quotes ancient authors who express themselves at similar moments. And that's what he's doing. Um, so I think you can weave enough material to have a sense of, of them really feeling in a way that's very similar to, to ancient poetry. In the case of Rubens, of whom we have a lot of correspondence. So I think that concludes our, our afternoon. So thank you all. Thank you to our speakers. Coming.